Okay, we have, we have 15 minutes, we have some mics, and uh, I have lots of stuff that I could say to them, but I can say that privately. It's time for you guys to uh, respond to what you've just been hearing. Anybody? Yeah. Ah. No. Nope. Well, we could Rude. hear people. <coughs> Thank you for all the uh, speakers. Wonderful job. Uh, my name is Safi Hamid. I'm with the Center for Egyptian American Relations. And uh, my question probably is to Hussein and uh, Nader. Um, if we take the assumption that uh, President Trump is uh, truly a businessman and that's the focus of his mind, um, any businessman know that, uh, knows that you need to win the hearts and minds of your clients. Mm. And in this case, of course, uh, it's the world. It also does not take a, a rocket science scientists to uh, know that actions speak loudly and uh, more than words, but even words are good. Um, and also he should, with his team, understand that the problem in the Arab world is that uh, the governments are in one side and the people are in a different side, with a very few exceptions like Tunis, for instance. Hmm. Um, and that the, the, the oppressed in this whole, uh, the more oppressed will be the youth. 60% of the population are youth who are facing a very grim uh, future. And the women who have been oppressed for a long time. Mm -hmm. These things that, you know... Um, so can uh, I, I'm going to... Uh, I am going to ask the question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the question is basically, do you think... President Trump and his team, who are obviously still wandering around, are capable of quickly finding or caring about putting a homogeneous policy, foreign policy, especially for the Arab and the Muslim world, who can meet the criteria I just mentioned. Thank you. No, I don't think so. Um, I think where there is competency in the administration, the orientation is towards security and military to military relations and government to government relations. Uh, and I think that beyond that, there is a lack of competency, a lack of experience, uh, a lack of interest in uh, learning much and a, 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 a lack of regard for the institutions uh, such as the State Department or even the intelligence community that could inform the administration but which are uh, held to be hostile Nazis in case of the intelligence <laughs> community or uh, an ir irrelevant bunch of spongers to be sacked in the uh, cut by one third in the case of the State Department and certainly to be ignored right now, which they are being. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty skeptical about that, and if you're interested in details about where I think uh, the biggest problems to getting to any kind of coherent policy, let alone the one that uh, you outlined, uh, you could look at my paper, uh, on, which I just published this afternoon, uh, searching for Trump Middle East mm -hmm. policy and not finding one, and not uh, finding a lot of reason to believe there's going to be one that's coherent even on its own terms, right? That's let alone the one that you sketched out. Yep. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with Hossein, um, but with one uh, big difference. Um, um, I'm much more pessimistic. <laughs> and the reason why I say that <laughs> is that um, with respect to Trump, you know, it's pretty clear that we're heading toward impeachment. That's gonna focus this administration. Trying to come up with a coherent policy about anything is, uh, I think just a tall order that's not in the offering. But let's just roll it back a bit. Mm. The Obama administration. Mm. Very smart people in that administration, from the president to the secretary of state to, to, the, to the people who worked in the State Department, really professional, really thoughtful. Um, what was their policy 
toward the Middle East and the broader Arab world that spoke to the issues that you just raised. Yeah. And, uh, there, wasn't, there was a lot of nice talk, and during the Arab Spring, a lot of good speeches, but the policy basically was the same. Embracing authoritarian regimes, very short-term calculations, no long-term grand strategy that cares about women or youth, and simply hoping that these regimes that we have trade relationships with and security relationships with are going to be the guarantors of our interests. Hmm. And you know, we've seen that movie before, we've tried that policy, in many ways it has gotten us to where we are today. So it's not just about the Trump administration and the you know, complete you know, incoherency of that administration. I would say the problem is a much broader US foreign policy orientation toward the Middle East. When even you get someone like Bernie Sanders, who's on the left of the Democratic Party, during the election campaign when he was asked to talk about the Middle East, and he said there's one hero in the Middle East that I want to sort of celebrate and recognize. And that hero is King Abdullah of Jordan. Which guarantee, you know, he's much better than a lot of these other <laughs> regimes. But a hero, a role model for the region? That's where we are in terms of the discourse. And that's why I think, you know, we're, we're in a, the problem is much deeper than simply Trump. Uh, can I just say one okay. quick thing? I dealt with the Obama administration quite a lot in the first term, and then they wouldn't talk to me at all in the second term. Uh, but I do know them, and uh, there wasn't a great, uh, I, I, I just don't think there was a great uh, reservoir of expertise, knowledge. I think the people who called the shots about the Middle East didn't know anything about Middle Eastern history, didn't know any Arabic, didn't know, didn't know what they were talking about. In fact, I know they didn't know what they were talking about because I was in meetings with them, and I would point out simple, basic stuff. And they would either say no or give me this blank expression or say something ridiculous. So, I mean, yes, they were, they were sort of not as absurd as, as Mr. Trump and some of the people around him, that's for sure. But they were not competent when it came to them. They were not minimally competent on the Middle East. Certainly when it came to Syria, they had no idea. They, they just thought in terms of Iraq, uh, 2003 to 2006, as if... There was no difference between Syria and Iraq, and no difference between 2004 and 2014. Uh, it's pathetic, really. And it wasn't great. <laughs> yeah. okay, yes. Hi, um, I'm Netra Halperin from Peace Films. Um, I had a question, um, uh, Nadir Hashimi, if I say that right. Um, your comment that um, there's been a lot of naivete, a, a naive belief that supporting authoritarian regimes will bring stability. So I'm questioning, is it really naive, or is the, is the agenda not about bringing stability? You know, is there financial uh, reasons, American corporations? Um, is it like uh, Dr. Dardari said, that the US doesn't really want democracies there? Um, it's easier for them to deal with a you know, dictator, then they don't have to deal with all those people and all their needs. So that's my question. No, I think those two actually are related. It's not either or. I think the United mm. States wants stability, mm. and it wants an environment for advancing business and trade relationships. And it just feels that in the short term, the best way it can do that is by um, supporting these authoritarian regimes and not doing what is granted the much more tougher task, mm. the much more onerous task that requires a long-term strategy that requires an investment before you get the rewards about in questions of good governance, political development, and democratization. I mean, I think the United States would, I would disagree with the other speaker that, you know, Europe and the United States, you know, can't accept or don't want a Muslim democracy. I think they're very happy, they would be very happy if there was a Muslim democracy that was stable and that was sort of you know, advancing US interests. There's no problem with democracy. When Turkey was democratizing under Erdogan from let's say 2002 until let's say at best 2013, the United States was very happy with that. You know? And they often pointed to Erdogan as a role model for the rest of the Islamic world because Turkey was a NATO member, it was expanding its democracy. Um, the problem really is that you know, democratic transitions, as we know, in Tunisia yeah, very are very risky. difficult. Yeah. Um, the, there's no guarantee that they will turn out successful. Most democratic transitions fail. And, you know, the, the other problem is that, you know, our policy is really made, and I don't know how we get out of this problem, is made around our electoral cycles, two mm -hmm. years, four years, at most eight years. Um, yeah, there's there's no not a long-term strategy. And I think the absence of that uh, long-term strategy 
forces us to fall back on the easy, yeah. you know, there's a, there's a crisis in Egypt, democracy is over, well, let's just hope CC will, mm -hmm. you know, save the day. But of course, what he's doing is just sowing the, gr the groundwork for greater radicalization and instability as we're seeing right now. Uh, yeah, the only way out of the election cycle is to have an issue that's big enough and pressing enough and crisis-like enough over a long enough period of time that you get a consensus yeah. policy of the Cold War. Yeah. There was a Cold War consensus yeah. between some 47, 48. Well, I think the radicalization, the rise of ISIS, this, we're seeing once again a, a radical Islamist crisis after 9-11. How do we get out of this? There's no consensus here, and you're, we're going to be trapped in that cyclical thing for a while. You're right, there is no consensus no. on that issue. No. Agree. On the, okay. issue, the, the issue is not really stability versus democracy. The issue is the stability on what basis? Is it on democratic basis or authoritarian basis? This is where the distinction is. Yeah, but they would take either, is not just point, and I think you're right. I think, I think it, it's, it's more uh, the outcome than the process, which is, yeah, I mean, it's been critiqued by both of you very well, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we've got, I think, two, so let's have each of the two questions together and then uh, together and then I have uh, I will ask a third question that give you each a chance to finish mm -hmm. so yes okay do any of the panelists believe that Muslim populated countries will ever be able to make real progress beyond the approval process of the West, and, and if, you, if it's not possible now, will they ever be able to make real process without going through the prism of Western approval? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. My name's uh, Salah Sarhan. Uh, I'm the head of the Arab League mission in Washington. Um, my question again, was, I would like to thank the gentlemen about what they said about the, the Arab uh, uh, leaders, and I feel very sorry about this gloomy pictures about about them. Uh, well, this is this is a free country; they have the right to criticize what they said about uh, Saudi Arabia, what they said about Egypt, what they said about Sudan, about. The, but I find it. It's unfair not to mention Israel in this, in this issue. Mm -hmm. We know what, what is the Israel, Israel is doing with the Palestinians, with the killing, with the torturing, with, with the treating them unfairly. And even, even politically, they are not um, accepting the two-state solution. Nobody talks about Israel. They talk about Sudan, they talk about Saudi Arabia, the, no, no problem. We can talk about that. No problem. It's a free country, as I said. But it's unfair not to talk about, about Israel. You are right about that. I, uh, the other question is for uh, to Mr. Rudwan. Mr. Rudwan, he said no, no future for the Arab, no future for the rule of Arab for uh, Arab League. I disagree with you, Rudwan. You know how Arab League are uh, are uh, doing uh, whatever they are making, even with the Syrian Syrian crisis. Whatever we have made about the Syrian crisis when we started discussing about Syria, so we have made a good effort. In, in, in this crisis. Imagine any organization in the world, they have six crises, Yemen, Palestine, Libya, Iraq. How, they, how can they, they make progress? Mm -hmm. It's overwhelming. So mm -hmm. please be fair with that. Even, even with the Syrian, Syrian crisis, you remember that, but you didn't mention how the Arab League did for, for, the, for, the, for the Syrian. And uh, I leave it to you to be fair with that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Now, and we, I, would, those are things that all four of you can respond to. Mm -hmm. And let me suggest a framework for responding to that. And that is at the 28th meeting of the CSID annual conference, at the panel that says, President Fulan's embrace of political authoritarianism wither the future of the Arab Islamic world. What do you think your presentation would be that would be different from your presentation today. In how many years? Ten. In ten, ten years? years from now. Ten years. Okay. Ten years. So let's uh, go ahead. Let and let's start with that. Let, okay. Let's just come right on sure. down and we can finish mm -hmm. with, with, I hope, an okay. inspiring. <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, let me start recognizing Ambassador Salah Sarhan and thank you for uh, uh, be, being here. Uh, I did not. Uh, uh, say that there is no future to the Arab League. I'm actually pushing the Arab League to do more. Uh, the Arab League, it's the oldest regional organization in the world before the UN. 
But look actually where actually the African Union, where the EU and Pan-American organization moved. No, but, but they did have actually difficult transition in Latin America, in, in Eastern Europe, in the EU. This is why I, I think that the, the Arab League, it's much more important to adopt the model of the EU to move beyond. And what I felt so sad actually in the last, the Arab, in the last Arab summit in, in, in Amman, where actually the, Arab secre the, 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 the general secretary of the Arab uh, League himself put a very glim picture of the Arab League just regarding in the financial issue. There is, a, there is a lack of $60 million, at least, mm -hmm. at least 15 or 16 countries, they never actually uh, pay their contribution to the <laughs> Arab League. That reflects that how much they believe, how much they invest in the Arab League, would they, which it should be now the leading model actually to help these six or seven countries you mentioned in a crisis to move beyond. What I'm saying that there is a need and there is a challenge for the Arab League to do more because otherwise actually the Arab League, it's a key role in, 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 any, in, in any successful uh, t t transition. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in response uh, into your questions, there is a positive change, of course, in, in, in the region. And we have to, in the region, and we have uh, to put that into, into the uh, structures. What I mentioned in my presentations, this is the first time we see actually the high approval rate into the concept of democracy itself. I mean, 10 years mm -hmm. ago, there is no such acceptance to the term of democracy. There is now acceptance to be a difference and accept to be a ruler, accept of the concept of the bullerism. And this is why it, it gives you a change within the civil society, mm. within the, 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 uh, 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 the culture of the political culture in the region. Now the question how the change in the culture, the political culture in the region will reflect into the political elite and will reflect into, uh, in, in, into the way of, 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 of go governance in the region. <coughs> I think Maudia, Tunisia, it has a best model of that. How that they, they can handle the political crisis through the negotiation and diplomacy. Uh, the, now the questions uh, 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 there, is, there, there is a collapse, of course, in, in, in the key four countries. Uh, and and it's, it's not, it's not uh, uh, Hussein, Hussein mentioned actually that, that uh, the, the lack of the understanding of the region. Right. It's not by chance, it's not by coincidence that to have ISIS in Syria and Iraq. Mm -hmm. Syria, where actually the Umayyad civilization and Iraq is the Abbas civilization, with, with they have the golden age of Islam. And both run by the Ba'ath party, who actually believe in ban, Amer in ban Arab, Arabism. Then those countries to be replaced by the ISIS tell you something yeah. about the total failure mm -hmm. of the Arab, modern Arab mm -hmm. state. Completely. Mm -hmm. Completely. Okay. So I'm and this is why I'm seeing that, that we have a deep, deep change and deep transition, not only that it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not only about uh, demonstrations and change, but also deep culture change. Mm -hmm. ISIS, it's a big answer, it's a big, big challenge, and we have to answer it. Mm -hmm. Right, and I'm gonna just say, we're, we're gonna, everybody will faint uh, if we stay too long, so yeah, just we'll a couple quick, of, quick, yeah. very quick. Quickly. Um, John, 10 years from now, I'll be saying the exact same things mm. that I'm saying right now as long as the current social and political yeah. conditions remain in place. In other words, it comes down to good governance, it comes down to hope. 15 years ago, the UN Human Development Report published its first report, which <laughs> predicted the current turmoil and crisis that the region was facing. It said there was three key deficits in the Arab world, a freedom deficit, a women's empowerment deficit, and a knowledge deficit. Unless that changes, we are going to be reproducing these problems and facing them time and time again. And this gets me to the gentleman's question about can, what can the West do? Can there be support? You know, with the election of Donald Trump, I mean, the fundamental reality is you cannot support democracy abroad unless you have it at home. Mm -hmm. And we no longer have it at home like we used to, which raises fundamental questions as to whether the United States can be promoting democratization abroad. So that's why I think what's happening yeah. here in the United States in terms of our own current 
you know, declining democracy matters so much, not just for us, but I think for the prospects of the U.S. being a, a positive force in terms of promoting democracy in other countries. And I'll end there. Great. Uh, definitely. Definitely. Um, okay, so uh, th this notion of Western approval, uh, I just want to say, is, is, is not right. It, it's a cop-out. Uh, about 300 million people in the Arab world. I mean, they can do what they want. I mean, in, in a very rare instance here and there, there could be outside interference that makes life difficult for them, but no one can control these societies. Uh, look, if, if Iran could go uh, the way of Khomeini, against the wishes of both the United States and the Soviet Union in 1979, and bringing down a, a pretty powerful government and a well-integrated state, it just goes to show that when a society wants to do something, including something fundamentally wrong-headed, no one can stop them from doing it. So, I mean, basically, this is, this is not really, uh, it's a secondary issue. The primary issue is internal uh, to, to these societies. Uh, Your Excellency, with all due respect, I wasn't gloomy at all. On the three things that I pointed out, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that the United States will return to more human rights as they did uh, under Reagan because it's important to the United States. Uh, that uh, the Saudi experiment is an important one and it should be encouraged and I believe it has real seeds for progress in it and should be supported, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about it. Uh, and finally, uh, my description of what I think is a disintegration of the old-fashioned Muslim Brotherhood contains on one side a very positive trend, which is the emergence of post-Islamist groups that are conservative and religious, but not revolutionary and underground and all these things like that, yeah, there, there's a problem with, uh, with violent extremist organizations. So, I mean, we know that. That, uh, I hope, will be eliminated by everyone working together. But this is not a gloomy outlook. It's cautiously optimistic outlook. And I, so, I, I can't accept that I'm gloomy. Um, finally, what would I... And Israel is a problem, no matter what. I mean, it's just... But, but our question was whether the Arab and Islamic world, not, not the Jewish world. So, the, uh, what would... Uh, it would be different in 10 years. Um, we would know more about the two trends. We would know mm -hmm. more where the Islamist movement is going and, and the, uh, the extent to which the violent extremists continue to thrive or not. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident about the growth of the Muslim Democrats. I, I don't really doubt that that's going to continue and, and, and prosper. Uh, because it's necessary and uh, there's too much momentum behind it in certain places and that will inspire others. Uh, we'll know more about the violent extremists and whether they continue to thrive in these uh, war-torn countries and chaotic and where there's uh, real repression that, that drives people in that direction, some people in that direction. The other, uh, we'll, we'll know more in 10 years whether, whether mm -hmm. the, the, these experiments uh, that are positive work and whether the, the bad trends continue. I think probably not more than that in 10 years. <laughs> Right, thank you. And yeah, concerning development in the Muslim world without the approval of the West, uh, I used to think it was possible. Hmm. Uh, but I came to realization that it is not 100% possible without this mutual understanding, uh, mutual interest. There has to be really an understanding in the Western societies as well as in the Arab and Muslim societies that there is a need for a mutual project for the interest of both parties, not just one or the other. If we really all sides succeed in doing and creating this environment for mutuality, we will be able to produce better alternative. My concern is if we leave the extremists on both sides, the extremists on the Muslim side, as well as the Islamophobes on the other side, to set the agenda for the future, most likely we'll, have, we'll be having serious uh, challenges in the future. That's fair enough. Concerning the 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, I think the authoritarianism that is going on uh, in the Arab world and the Muslim world is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. What the Arab Spring did, it is it, pla it uh, planted the seeds for freedom, democracy, and human rights. And it is likely to produce good fruits for this. It is going to take some time. But like all communities, uh, democracy is a process. It is not one time thing. We've had one year or uh, almost two years of experiment of democracy in Egypt, we are dreaming of this time. Most likely we'll be working with others who are interested in democracy, human rights, and rule of law all over the world so that we'll produce a better alternative that can serve the interests of Arabs, Muslims, and Americans at the same time. Great. Well, thank you, panel, for some...
hand now Redwan. Uh, thank you the, very much, John, and, and the whole panel. Uh, just one minute closing remarks. Uh, so I know you're all tired and uh, want to go home. Um, I think this has been a very uh, successful conference. I think one of the best conferences we've had so far. Um, so I must thank all the speakers, uh, many of whom came from very far away distances to join us today. So thank you all for, uh, for uh, your participation and the moderators as well who uh, kept the, did a good job of uh, keeping us on schedule and, and keeping the discussion lively. I uh, must thank all of you, the participants, especially those of you who stayed until now. So I uh, know that's, <laughs> that's not easy. So uh, thank you very much for attending the conference. I must also thank the CSID staff and volunteers uh, for their help in organizing uh, the conference and making sure it, everything went smoothly. Um, we did live streaming today, uh, just to let you know, you know, we had uh, hundreds of people who watched uh, the conference live on, on the internet, uh, and yeah, all over the world, um, and on Facebook in addition to the live streaming that we did. Um, we also have an email list that has 50,000 people, uh, policy makers and experts all over the world. We will be sending them links to all the videos of the panels and all the discussions and a very detailed report uh, on uh, all these uh, ideas that we uh, discussed today. These are very tough times and very challenging times for all of us, but uh, I think um, with challenge comes opportunity. It means that we have an opportunity for change. We have an opportunity that things will be different uh, we have an opportunity to build a better future for the Muslim world, for the United States, for relations between the U.S. and Muslim world. I think the status, uh, status quo is crumbling. And that means it's not sustainable. It will not continue. So the crumbling is difficult, but hopefully there is a better future that lies ahead. There is a different, at least a different future. But the transition will be difficult. So the transition will be... Uh, uh, difficult and painful. This is why we must uh, work together, we must uh, redouble our efforts uh, to work together, to think about how we do we build that better future, how do we work together and contribute uh, in, uh, in building a better future for, uh, for the Muslim world and for the United States. Uh, we, must remain, um, we must remain engaged now more than ever uh, our voice is important now more than ever. So, um, you know, and we need your help, we need your support uh, for CSID now more than ever. So, uh, again, thank you very much for coming. I hope we stay in touch and I look forward to seeing you again uh, at uh, near, uh, near uh, I mean, uh, uh, our uh, future events, um, whether here in Washington, D.C. or in Tunisia. And I invite you all to come to Tunisia and uh, see the birth of democracy, and I, I, I hope it will continue and, uh, and serve as a, as a model for, for the entire region, which desperately needs a model, a better model than, than what we've had uh, so far. So again, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully see you soon.